Hi everyone, welcome to another subspecial TVMR. Uh, today we are here to discuss more about hematology. I'm really excited. Uh, my name is Marcela, I'm a doctor from Brazil. Uh, so let's start with our guests. We have Dr. Aaron Goodman. Uh, he's an associate professor of medicine at the University of California, San Diego, and a hematologist who is specialized in treating a variety of blood cancers, including AML, ALL, and multiple myeloma. So Dr. Goodman, could you please introduce yourself, a bit about yourself, and what you like to do outside of medicine? Hi, thanks for having me. It's great to get to meet all you from all over, I guess, the, the world. So that's cool. Um, I, yeah, I'm a bone marrow transplant and kind of a, you know, I'm a specialist, but we kind of, our practice is we treat all malignant blood cancers from diagnosis, uh, hopefully to cure. And if they need a transplant or cellular therapy, we perform that uh, ourselves. But I take care of many patients who don't need transplants. And I do 12 weeks of inpatient attending on the bone marrow transplant cell therapy service. Um, so very busy clinically. Uh, um, as far as, uh, you know, I have three young girls um, and um, like I took one, I took them to gymnastics today. We play a lot of guitar and music in our house. Uh, we like to go on a lot of runs and exercise. So we're, we're very outdoor family uh, 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 year round. So that's kind of what I like to do. Oh, that's amazing. Thank you for sharing with us. Uh, yeah. We also have Dr. Gabriel Leishu, who is presenting the case. He's a PGY3 internal medicine resident at Cleveland Clinic, uh, who is interested in hematology and oncology. So Dr. Leishu, could you please introduce yourself, uh, tell uh, for us what you like to do at the side of medicine? Hi, uh, well, th thank you so much, uh, Rafa, everybody for having me. It's a real honor to be here. Uh, my name is Gabriel uh, Aleixo, as you said. Uh, everybody calls me Gabe here. Um, I'm a PGY3. I love Hemonk. Um, outside of medicine, I love to cook. I had a career before as a chef, and um, I also am just learning how to be a husband because I got married about 10 days ago, time just flies. So 10 days ago. So it's cool. <laughs> cool. Congratulations. Yeah, congratulations. Yeah, that's so nice. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you for sharing that with us. Uh, yeah. So we also have some CP Silver's team members. Uh, we have Deborah here describing for us today. Deborah, could you please introduce yourself? Uh, tell us what you like to do outside of medicine. Hi, everyone. Um, we have another great Monday specialty. I'm excited about it. And outside medicine, I like to watch movies. And normally, I like to watch movies that I had watched before. I don't want to watch new movies. I want to watch the, the same one that I have watched a hundred times. So that's the thing that I normally do it. And yeah, excited for today. Thank you, Deborah. Yeah, it's awesome. Also the same for me, like so such a good comfort to watch a movie that you know what is going to happen, right? Uh, we also have Sammy uh, doing the teaching point. So Sammy, can you introduce yourself and tell us what you like to do at a side of medicine? Hey, sure. Hi, my name is Sammy. I'm a last year medical student from the Medical University of Graz in Austria, currently doing a clinical rotation in infectious diseases in Kansas City. <laughs> and today it got really late. I got out of the hospital at like seven or eight in the evening. So a lot of consults. And yeah, I'm really hyped for this session today. I'm a huge fan, a fan of Dr. Goodman. Um, on Twitter, I basically like learn every day from him. And so happy to have Dr. Alexa here. I'm very hyped for the case. Um, something I do outside of medicine. I do like sports a lot. I go like going for a run and lifting weights just getting the physical energy out after a lot of thinking and studying. So yeah, really looking forward to this session and thank you all for coming and thank you Rafa for organizing this. Yeah, thank you, Sam. Yeah, you're right. Dr. Goodman is amazing on Twitter. If you don't follow him, you should definitely do that right now. Uh, so let's start. God, now I'm, the expectations are high. I, I might be way worse in person than on, on Twitter, so. <laughs> oh, I'm sure not, yeah. <laughs> Deborah, can you share your screen, please?
Yeah, so Dr. Alessio, the mic is yours. You can start. Ooh, okay, so let's go. Uh, it might be a little different than the one I sent you guys. So just a little detail. So let's go with the part one. Um, very common, 65 year old gentleman comes to my outpatient clinic, just saying, you know, doc, I'm a little fatigued. And um, this has been going on for the past six months. He endorsed that he has been like very tired, sometimes sleeping a little more. He slept uh, around eight hours every night and also has like, a, uh, like more frequent lunch naps that uh, usually go up to one hour every day. He also noticed that on 4th of July, when he played with his grandkids that came from Florida, he had some shortness of breath that he never had before. He also told me that last winter, he was shoveling some snow, hitting beautiful Cleveland uh, winter, and he felt some neck pain. That improved, but that was only that time. It was a sharp uh, pain uh, and improved with some rest, no other episodes. He also noticed that after he, you know, played with his grandkids, he's having some new bruises in his arms. But um, he said that never happened before. Any, um, anything else? Anything you would like to know more about this uh, yeah. fun gentleman? Mm -hmm. So Dr. Goodman, the mic is yours. What are your first thoughts? You need to unmute yourself, yeah. Sorry, uh, I, I've done, uh, that will probably happen a few times during this. Uh, I've done a, a, a bunch of CPCs and watched a few. And uh, what I won't do is I'm not gonna list 10,000 diagnoses that can cause shortness of breath because that's not really gonna, gonna help anyone. So I'm going to, uh, 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 whenever I do these, I'm gonna just try to arrive at the answer as fast as possible and tell you how my mind changes every step of the way. Uh, uh, as we go through this. Now, granted, I know I'm a hematologist and this is probably going to be heme oriented, <laughs> but we have a 65 year old gentleman. And, you know, I, I would like to know before really I ask more specific questions, I want to know what I'm dealing with here in this 65 year old gentleman. Am I dealing with good heart and lungs or am I dealing with, you know, I want to know his medical history right at this point. Uh, Cause that, you know, right. If this is a guy with congestive heart failure, that's going to, it's not going to be the case, but it would change things dramatically. So what are his medical problems? Very good. So yeah, um, his, I'll give like the full um, medical and social history. So basically his medical history is just like hypertension, hyperlipidemia, uh, and uh, some pre-diabetes. Um, his surgical history, he had an epidentectomy when he was uh, 34 years old. Family history, nothing to mention. His review of systems is just the ones that I mentioned above. His PHQ24 depression is negative. He cooks vegetables and eats fish about two times a week. Uh, no drenching sweats, no lymphadenopathy, uh, and his social history. He lives in Cleveland, family is from Florida. He is a retired house painter, smoked about one pack per day for 30 years but he quit 15 years ago. He drinks around two beers on every Monday night football, but only for the Cleveland um, Browns, when, only when they play. Okay, so, so, so not too bad for a 65 year old, his medical history other than his smoking history. So going back to, you know, you know we'll, we'll, we'll start with the differential things that I will ask, you know, um, you know, if you wouldn't have said the bruising and the fact that I'm a hematologist, common being common, you know, I, I would go down more the cardiovascular shortness of breath route. Uh, I, I'm not going to do so. Uh, um, um, we have here uh, not an acute shortness of breath, but this has kind of been slowly evolving over the last six months, or not really the shortness of breath, the fatigue, and then progressing to shortness of breath, uh, uh, and then the bruises on the arm. So 
you know, I, I, I'm thinking anemia uh, and possibly uh, with bruises, thrombocytopenia, uh, which would already then be two lineages in, in the bone marrow, right? The trifecta, the white blood cells, the platelets and the hemoglobin. And when I see, you know, more than one lineage uh, uh, being uh, uh, potentially uh, down or decreased, uh, I usually think of a marrow process uh, uh, as opposed to, uh, uh, you know, like a hemolytic anemia, which would just be the red blood cell. So I'm feeling a potentially marrow process. Now he doesn't have any recurrent infections or things like that, but you know, you can be neutropenic or leukopenic for quite some time before that kind of stuff happens. So that doesn't mean he doesn't have a, a low white blood cell count. Also a simple CBC is going to answer that question really, uh, 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 guide, uh, 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 further diagnostic management. So like the very first thing that I'm going to want when we get to the testing, uh, after, for the physical exam is just going to be a simple CBC because clearly if that's normal, uh, then I'll scratch my head and go all the way back to, to, the, to the drawing board and think more cardiovascular. But that's where I'm thinking. Usually with just simple anemia, which is commonly the first presenting uh, cytopenia uh, uh, in uh, uh, marrow disorders, fatigue is the most common. Uh, sorry, there was a big truck going by. Uh, the most common complaint. Uh, um, and it's usually not to your uh, more anemic, typically you know, sevens to eights, or maybe even sixes that you start feeling short of breath uh, for, from your anemia. You know, you're not going to be short of breath with a hemoglobin of 10 or 11. Uh, and again, if it goes down suddenly, like in a GI bleed, your symptoms will not be as such. Your symptoms will be, you know, low blood pressure, tachycardia, and acutely ill in a more insidious process, like many of the marrow disorders uh, that are more gradual, uh, the, the, the symptoms will be like this. And then the bruising platelets, uh, 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 again, it could be, uh, co you know, INR, PT, PTT type things, but I'm feeling more platelets with those symptoms. Is he bleeding anywhere else or is it just the bruising? And with it's those just, bruises, yeah. It, it's just a bruise. So, so some things. So the shortness of breath that he had, it was only one episode in 4th okay. of July. And, uh, he's not bleeding anywhere. Uh, he got a colonoscopy about a year ago, which only showed like some polyps. They were removed and uh, it was recommended a follow up in five years yeah. uh, because he drinks. Uh, he had an ultrasound of the liver, which was normal. EKG done a few days uh, ago was normal. X-ray didn't show anything. Uh, his medications are Torvastatin, 40 daily I'm low to pink tan and vitamin D. Okay, so nothing crazy. Uh, yeah. Nothing. His physical exam, objectively. So his blood pressure, 115 over 82. Uh, heart rate, 18. Uh, no, uh, respiratory rate, 18. Heart rate, 85. Physical exam, no lymphadenopathy. Bruises in the arms. Uh, lungs are clear. Um, no swelling in the legs. Now I tell him to leave and to go get some blood work done. Yeah, just getting Super back to CBC. the chief complaint. Sorry, I, I, I you know, yeah. just fatigue. How I think about fatigue in general, you know, the most common complaint that we see in all of our clinics is fatigue. So one is just their fatigue, and it's not anything other than for whatever reason they're tired. You know, uh, which is uh, not a true pathological cause of fatigue. Uh, the next thing I think of with fatigue is as endocrine endocrine related stuff, whether it's uh, thyroid is usually the most common, uh, uh, but adrenal or really anything in your endocrine access. Uh, and then I think of hematologic, which is anemia, uh, uh, and then uh, fatigue with systemic illnesses, inflammatory. But those usually have other things going on uh, that would clue you into that. And this guy has no inflammatory symptoms like joint pains, uh, fevers, night sweats. Uh, um, and, you know, for cardiovascular disease, you know, uh, heart disease, coronary disease, fatigue is the only isolated symptom would be quite unusual. So in someone like this with fatigue, that's insidious and onset, that clearly is a change from how it used to be. Uh, I'm feeling it's either hematologic anemia or endocrine is where I would be. And again, I would simply start with a CBC in this general, in this person. If it's, if it's normal, then start doing some of the endocrine related stuff. Uh, so that's how I'd approach his fatigue. In, in fatigue so in an old person, I never, you know, if someone has new fatigue, I, you know, I always get at least a CBC and a metabolic panel. I mean, you know, uh, who knows, you know, I left out, high, you know, electrolyte hypercalcemia. I mean, a simple that, that at least, if those are normal, I'm feeling better about things uh, before I dismiss it. So someone who's 65, who's not 
been tired before uh, that is really coming to you complaining about this, at the very least, a CBC and a CM CMP. And, and his exam that you told me really was, was not helpful, right? There's not much on his exam at all, right? That's how I like no. it. I don't like physical exams. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, let's, the only thing I want right now is the CBC. Okay, so the CBC showed a hemoglobin of 7.5, an MCV of 109. Um, do you want with differentials or without differentials? Uh, well, let me get, what's the white cell count total? 1.5. Oh, 1.5, yeah, what's his ANC? 0 0.8. Okay, and um, yeah, I don't, you don't need to list all the other ones unless there was a markedly abnormal, like monocyte. Platelet 75, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so so here we go. I mean, we really will get some other labs, but so here is a 65. And I'm assuming at this point, everyone should ask, what was his last CBC and when? Uh, uh, um, to really get an understanding of the tempo of, of this, just like with a chest x-ray, what's the most important compared to the old chest x-ray? So in a lot of times we won't have this, but do we have an old CBC available? Five years ago, everything was normal. Okay. So this happens between five years ago and now. Uh, but at the very least, this has probably been going on for right six months because he's been having symptoms and uh, that are likely related to this. And then prior to that, there might have been some sub you know, stuff going on before it re reached symptoms. So my time period would be a, a six months to a year. I think it's safe to say this, this process has been occurring. And, you know, if we, you know, we're going to talk about macrocytic anemia, but you know, my approach to isolated macrocytic anemia versus macrocytic anemia in the context of pancytopenia are dramatically different, but we'll just talk about isolated macrocytic anemia. Isolated macrocytic anemia, uh, uh, I'm meaning with a normal white cell and platelet count. I think we all think of the two B12 folic acid uh, deficiencies. Um, and then uh, something that's commonly uh, missed is uh, hemolytic anemia. Reticulocytes are big. Uh, um, so um, you can actually present with a macrocytic anemia from hemolysis. Uh, um, so you still want to check that. A lot of people skip the retic. It's actually very important in a macrocytic anemia. So uh, uh, for isolated macrocytic anemia, I do check a retic, a smear, uh, look at hemolysis labs. And if there's evidence of hemolysis, you always check a Coombs first because your Coombs positive hemolytic anemias versus your non are completely different ball games. I don't suspect this will be that because we have pancytopenia. So that is my approach to isolated macrocytic anemia. It is make sure there's no hemolysis, B12 folic acid. Then I check the medications because there are many medications that can cause macrocytic anemias, metformin, and there's a whole list. There's a great New England Journal paper that's worth downloading of medication-induced macrocytic anemia. I'm looking at his meds and none of those are going to do it, but that's my order. And if now, if you, if you do that and the B12 folic acid is normal, he's not hemolyzing and there are no medicines and they have a true like hemoglobin of nine and a high MCV, you actually have to do a bone marrow because- at that point, I'm worried about, you know, a unilineage myelodysplastic syndrome, most commonly refractory anemia, ring sideroblast. So not all macrocytic anemias need a bone marrow, but you can't, you need to have an explanation for an MCV of 109 in the setting of an isolated uh, anemia. Okay, so that is, that's all you have to do for macrocytic anemia. B12 folic acid, drugs, rule out hemolysis, get a marrow if those are all done, and then you'll get your answer. Okay, I mean, there's some weird, crazy esoterics you know, diamond black fen anemia that causes isolated macrocytic anemia. That's in young kids. That's not going to happen here. Uh, sometimes copper deficiency can do that, although that would be an incredibly rare presentation of, of, of copper deficiency. Now, in this gentleman, we're not dealing with that. We're dealing with pancytopenia. So if I see pancytopenia that's insidious and in onset, that is macrocytic, I am 100% worried about a bone marrow disorder. In, in this particular individual, I would be most worried. So right now my leading diagnosis is a myelodysplastic syndrome. Uh, uh, and there are many flavors of myelodysplastic syndromes that, that, that we can go over uh, um, as we get closer to the diagnosis if, if it ends up being a, a, a myelodysplastic syndrome. Uh, um, less, and I will say smoking is a risk factor for myeloid neoplasms, including MDS and AML. He was a smoker. Uh, the next on my, my differential uh, uh, would be frank acute leukemia. Uh, you can present with pancytopenia with acute leukemia. Um, typically, it's more abrupt. Um, and um, um, I, But that would still be on my differential, acute leukemia. Uh, just because the white cell count's not high doesn't mean it's not acute leukemia. Um, 
aplastic anemia uh, would be uh, uh, usually slightly younger than this, but you could see aplastic anemia, when I mean true idiopathic aplastic anemia that's immune mediated by T cells. And they are commonly have a macrocytic anemia too. Uh, so that would be on my differential. Less likely would be marrow replacement for metastatic cancer. I, I mean, like this would be, I can count on maybe one hand, someone that made it to, usually if they have such horrific metastatic cancer with marrow replacement, they have been found by another doctor, not the hematologist. That would be a very unusual, but small cell lung cancer can go to the marrow. That, but that would be that would be crazy, but but not impossible. Uh, but given what you're telling me and everything, I, I think that would be way lower on the differential. And then finally, infections, granulomatous infections, TB, sarcoid, things like that. But but that's also way lower on the differential uh, because he has nothing else going on. That would be incredibly unusual presentations of those infectious organisms. So. Um, uh, what this 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 guy 100% needs a, a, a bone marrow biopsy uh, for the concern of of hematologic malignancy MDS. But before we do that, uh, um, uh, I still you know I, I've never seen isolated B12 deficiency cause this much marrow suppression. Uh, but we would check a B12 and folic acid. Uh, I, I've been burned before on copper deficiency, where copper deficiency can cause. Um, um, a dysplastic, ugly looking marrow. Typically, if I do a bone marrow with pancytopenia and it's dysplastic, but there's no increase in blast and there's not one cytogenetic abnormality or no mutations, that would be very unusual for MDS. Usually there's something clonal, then I would check a copper. Some doctors check a copper just at the start because why not uh, check a copper? So that wouldn't be completely unreasonable. No thyroid disorder is going to do this. So I wouldn't even bother checking a, 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 a TSH. Um, and then we didn't talk about it, but um, you can have acute marrow suppression from a recent viral illness. It's usually more pronounced in children. This isn't happening in this guy. So I don't need any sort of infectious workup. So really all I need right now is a bone marrow biopsy. Uh, um, and uh, for completion's sake, uh, the metabolic panel. And uh, I like having an LDH, but that's not gonna change anything I do. And then we would check a B12 and folic acid, even though those are gonna be normal. Wow, that's, that's so cool. You too. Great. So I have actually all the tests that you were uh, were talking, doctor. So um, the metabolic panel is basically it's normal. Just say normal. Basically normal. The the creatinine is zero point eight. The calcium ten. LFTs are all normal. Just because he also drinks, I don't know if drinking. He drinks, but he does not drink. How that much does he much. drink again? I, I forgot about his boozing. How much? Two beer. Two beers on Monday night football. Only that's on. Gonna, that's not going to do this. Football, uh, yeah. I don't think he yeah. has cirrhosis, right? So, so cirrhosis, I left it out because I left it out, but I should have been more thorough uh, given the, what we're talking about. So cirrhosis with or without splenomegaly can cause pancytopenia like this that is elevated MCV, but he would have other stigmata of alcoholic liver disease. This guy you've told me has none of that. So it and is ultrasound not- ultrasound was normal. Yeah, yeah. That, that usually screams at you. When you see them in clinic, it's fairly obvious that their pancytopenia is from cirrhosis. And yeah, if this guy came in with splenomegaly and the history of super heavy, I wouldn't be doing a marrow. I would be saying, this is cirrhosis. And that would be, I would send him to hepatology and they wouldn't be able to help him unless they can give him a liver. So uh, I'm not worried about that. So I got his reticulocytes and uh, reticulocytes index were low. B12 was normal. Folate was normal. Iron panel, all normal. Homocysteine, normal. I don't check homocysteine. Yeah. No. No, that's a, yeah. Um, I, you only, I, I, yeah, yeah. I, I don't need any more unless there's some, yeah, just that. Did you check a copper? I'm curious. Uh, copper was normal. Okay. Uh, haptoglobin, normal. LDH, normal. ANA, normal. And all uh, the viral. Yeah. HIV, yeah. EBV, CMV, parvovirus, zinc. Yeah. So none of that, I wouldn't have checked any of that other than the HIV is important to check. And I do check HIV and everyone. I didn't bring that up. But the ANA and all that other stuff, uh, I, I, all I would have checked in this guy was uh, the labs that I told you. I left out HIV um, and hepatitis C. I usually do check, although it's almost certainly not necessary in many of these patients. Uh, like hep C without cirrhosis ain't going to cause pancytopenia. So so the only only addition, the EBV, CMV, that stuff's all useless. You don't need to do that stuff, I promise you. Cool. So then um, I went to the Samir first. Uh, oh, yeah, let's look at the smear. Okay, so the smear showed some. Oh, you don't have a picture of it? 
I I don't. Okay. <laughs> but I I have the reading which showed hypogranulated PMNs, pseudo pelgrichuet, hypoglobulated PMNs, ovo macro uh, macrocytosis, but no blasts. Yeah. So again, he needs a marrow yeah. fill, but that smear is suggestive of um, of some dysplasia. Um, so normally, uh, neutrophils should have three to five segments. Uh, if they're hyper or hypo segmented, so B12 is classically hyper segmented, greater than five. Um, pseudo pelgar Hewitt cells are bilobe neutrophils. So they call it pseudo because there's actually something called pelgar Hewitt anomaly, which is a congenital anomaly that doesn't cause any clinical sequelae and is associated with a laminin, a nuclear laminin mutation. And again, that's just a, it's just something you'll see in a smear. It's clinically irrelevant, but it's usually on boards. And then there is pseudo pelgar Hewitt anomaly, which is associated with myelodysplastic syndrome. So these macroovalocytes, the hyposegmentin, there is some suggestion of dysplasia that further increases what was already my number one in my differential uh, of myelodysplastic syndrome. Uh, um, but again, he, he, he still needs the bone marrow biopsy because as we'll talk about it, this ends up being myelodysplastic syndromes. There's many flavors. And the actual pathologic diagnosis of MDS doesn't matter so much as much as what their risk is, right? You can have MDS and be fine for 20 years, or you can have MDS and be dead in nine months. So those are important things we will we'll need to figure out if this ends up being an MDS. But that smear is more suggestive of an MDS than an aplastic anemia. Yeah, so let's go for the bone marrow biopsy, doctor. So it showed hypercellular multi-lineage dysplasia with 8% blasts, positive for ring sideroblasts mild fibrosis and uh, when we did the analysis of like uh, mutations we saw that it had a tp53 yeah. mutation okay oh it had a tp53 okay so yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so this is a uh, an mds uh, um with with excess blast one uh, under the old uh, uh diagnostic criteria there's actually just revised the who criteria and those with TP53 have their actually own criteria, MDS, AML with TP53. But that is actually only if they have biallelic TP53 mutations, meaning they have a TP53 mutation. So they have to have two, right? TP53 is a tumor suppressor. So it's, so we're like with oncogenes, right? Like RIAS uh, uh, or, you know, uh, or BCR able, you only need one because it turns on the cell. But with tumor suppressors, if you... If you only have one loss, you're okay because your other cell, your other copy is making it. So with you need both out with tumor suppressors. So TP53 myeloid neoplasms, you need to meet this new criteria, which was literally just changed a few weeks ago. You need two. And the way you assess if there's two is if the next generation sequencing has two different TP53 mutations, or if the TP53 is on the NGS and your cytogenetics, which you did not tell me. When I say cytogenetics, I mean the karyotype, the metaphase karyotype. Uh, there's a missing 17P or 17, or the FISH pro for 17 shows a, a loss of 17P. Do you have cytogenetics on that? Yes, yeah, cytogenetic with loss of 17P. Yeah, so this is a biallelic TP53 mutated. So this, as of two weeks ago, this just would have been called MDS with excess blast one. As of now, this would be called uh, amyloid MDS AML neoplasms with TP53 biallelic. So this is a biallelic this is horrible. This is horrible. Uh, uh, but 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 going back, so so that that is, and usually they have a bunch of other cytogenetic abnormalities. You didn't list all the numbers, but usually these patients have a whole. The, the carrier type comes back with like every number under the sun uh, uh, because with these TP53 losses. So you know that's his diagnosis. And then the next thing you really want to do is you want to restratify this guy, right? You know you can have good MDS. Well, nothing's good. You never want to tell a patient they have good cancer. Because even if it's like MDS that they're going to live 20 years, right? Imagine you're the patient. Like I used to do this too when I was a medical student resident. Be like, oh, you have CLL. You have it's the good cancer. Never say that because if you're the patient being told they have cancer, it it happens. It sucks. You know, and you need to take that into account uh, with the patient. So uh, I never phrase that. But but going back to MDS, you can have not so bad MDS where you live a long, long time, and you can have really, really bad MDS. And the old way we used to do this was off the revised IPSS which we looked at their degree of sight, you'd get points for these given things. 
One would be the how anemic they are. So this, I think he would get a, I don't have the exact cutoffs memorized, but I think he would get a point for that. You get points for how thrombocytopenic you are, how neutropenic. So he would get points for those. And then you get points for the amount of blast. Well, he's got 8% blast. That would get him a lot of points. And then you would get points for the cytogenetic abnormalities and he has bad cytogenetics. So on the old system, he would be a high or a very high uh, 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 revised IPSS, which has a median survival of about 0.8 to 0.9 months with a very high risk of transformation to acute myeloid leukemia. Of all that, even if you didn't know any of those things, having two TP53s, these patients do horrific. Um, they are all almost uniformly deceased within a year of diagnosis, even with intensive therapy and an allogeneic transplant. Um, there is nothing good. They almost all relapse no matter what we do. I quote long-term survival in those who get an allogeneic transplant of about 5%, meaning that's if we're lucky, we're curing 5%. But for this particular individual, I would just, I would tell him how bad this is. And I would do it in a, 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 a gentle way, better than what I just did with you guys. Uh, um, and um, I, I first, I'd recommend clinical studies. There are not many good clinical trials we have. At our center, we wouldn't have a good clinical study for him. Um, there are clinical studies looking at these TP53 like restorers, one's called AP50, AP whatever. It didn't work in the studies. So, but a clinical trial would be first. And then the standard of care, because he is not acute myeloid leukemia, to be honest, would just be azacitidine, a hypomethylating agent, either azacitidine or decitabine. Uh, those were studied in myelodysplastic syndromes and they were compared to best supportive care alone. And those had a survival advantage. So that's the endpoint that I like. There was a survival advantage. You know, typically when I talk about azacitidine with patients, uh, it has about a 40 to 50% chance of working. And when I say work, that does not mean cure. It means improving their blood counts. So typically I say a 40 to 50% chance of improving their blood counts, about a 17% chance of normalizing their blood counts. Meaning we, we give them this drug and they get it and, and, and they would go into a complete remission. So the CR rate's very low, but 40 to 50% do benefit. And by benefit, I mean better blood counts, less transfusions, they live longer, they feel better. Those are important endpoints. Typically when I start azacitidine, I tell the patient, don't get too excited. It's going to get worse before it gets better. Typically, you see a drop in counts with the azacitidine. And at the end of every uh, cycle, it comes up just a little bit. And what you want to see is this kind of upward trajectory. We don't quit azacitidine until at least four to six cycles. Most responses are achieved by cycle three to five. If they respond, responses on average are about a year or so. That's what I tell my patients to expect with that therapy. Off-label, some doctors would treat these patients with azacitidine plus venetoclax, which is a pill. That's a BCL2 inhibitor. That's not approved yet for myelodysplastic syndromes, but it is approved for acute myeloid leukemia, which is why I just told you the new classification system as of two weeks ago calls them the same thing for that sole purpose because they are, in fact, it, it's basically an AML equivalent, this disease. And uh, uh, we know from the uh, uh, Vial A study that Ven plus Aza versus azacitidine alone for acute myeloid leukemia has a higher response rate and a better overall survival. So if this patient was fit and wanted to do everything, I would try to give him venetoclax azacitidine and then consolidate with a reduced intensity allogeneic stem cell transplant. If we did all that, it still would only be about a five to 10% long-term survival, but it's not zero. And you know, that's the best we, we got. But most of these patients, they just, they relapse no matter what we do. And there are strategies looking post allo what to do to minimize that, like more T cell infusions, but it's all experimental. We don't absolutely know what to do. So um, it's an unfortunate diagnosis for the individual. Um, I just talked a long time, but I, I think I covered most of it. Um, what did yeah, I miss? The, can you, can you, uh, yeah. I mean, you got everything, Dr. Wow, <laughs> this is so cool. Can you uh, can you talk a little bit more, um, just for for us to understand uh, the concept of allogeneic stem cell transplant? Um, also, um, like how does it work? What are the barriers for success? Um, so, yeah, and I'm dealing just so I know this is mainly residents, right? I just want to know my my audience. Yeah, so I, I, yeah, so. Here's how I explain. I'm gonna explain how I explain to my patients because this is a complicated thing. So um, why do we do stem cell transplants? So there are 
two main types of stem cell transplants, okay? One is autologous, one is allogeneic. Let's first focus on autologous, which is where the, the patient gets their own stem cells back. And uh, this is not what we would use to treat this disease. We treat myeloma, lymphomas with this. And, and it's really not even a transplant, although we call it. I like to think of autologous stem cell transplant more as, as a stem cell rescue. Basically, let's say we have someone with relapsed lymphoma. We, the, we know that chemo can kill their lymphoma, but they relapse. So the theory is if you give them higher doses of chemo, you can kill those resistant cells. Well, what happens when you give really high doses of chemotherapy? You get toxicity. So what we do is we choose chemotherapeutics whose dose limiting toxicity is bone marrow death, myelosuppression or myeloablation. Like we wouldn't ever choose a drug like cisplatin because cisplatin would kill your kidneys at high doses. But a drug like a topicide, ARC, melphalan, uh, alkylating agents, other, you know, those drugs, their dose limiting toxicity is marrow aplasia. So what we do is we take a patient who needs an auto transplant. We then give them um, uh, medicines, one's called GCSF and one's called Mozabil. GCSF stimulates the bone marrow to make, uh, 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 for the stem cells to go into the blood. And then Mozabil uh, inhibits the interaction between the stem cells and the bone marrow stroma. And then the stem cells go into the blood and then we hook them up to, uh, it's not dialysis, it's like phoresis where we filter their blood out for CD34 positive stem cells. We then put them in a bag and we put the stem cells in a freezer. We then admit the patient to the hospital and we give them a lethal dose of chemotherapy. Meaning if we didn't do anything after the chemo, they would die of bone marrow failure. But after we give them the chemo, we then hang their stem cells. Uh, uh, it's just a transfusion, it's not a surgery. And about oh, 12 to 14 days later, their bone marrow grows back and they're on their way. Now, that's what an auto transplant is. Um, the success rate varies widely across the indications. But, it, but uh, now allogeneic transplant is similar, but different. It relies on two principles. One principle is the high dose chemotherapy to kill the cancer, much like auto, but there's also a graft versus uh, a, a leukemia or lymphoma effect. It's donor or immune system that in theory can kill the recipient's cancer. So what we do in an allogeneic transplant is we find a donor, uh, the first, and it has to be an indication for it. So high grade MDS, like this individual, acute myeloid leukemia, lymphoblastic leukemia, uh, and it's not all patients with these. It's that, and knowing the exact indications is way beyond your scope. Just know that we do it for those diseases and it's for patient, doctors like me to know when we do such things. Uh, but this guy has an indication for it. And we would first find a donor. We always look at siblings. Uh, they're the best donors. Each sibling has a 25% chance of being a, a perfect match. And when I say match, we look at the HLA, the immune system uh, of the uh, uh, donor and recipient. Um, usually patients with myelodysplastic syndromes, you know, they're old. So their siblings are old too. So they usually don't have great great siblings. You don't want to use really old people because their stem cells are no good. Um, and even if they have siblings, the odds of a sibling being a perfect match is one in four based off simple Mendelian genetics. So the next thing we will look at is a match to unrelated donor registry, which I have signed up for myself and I encourage all of you to do so. Uh, it's free. Just Google, how do I become a bone marrow transplant donor? They send you a kit and you sign up. I especially encourage underrepresented minorities for Hispanics, South Americans, uh, patients of African descent, uh, there is a paucity of donors uh, in the registry. So we have difficulty uh, 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 getting donors for those individuals. Uh, you know, a white dude like myself, we have a 70 to 90% chance of, of having a, a perfect match. Hispanics, it's more like 40%. Native Americans in my country, uh, it's like 20%. So uh, uh, um, it depends on, on, on their, their ethnicity, the chances of them finding a donor. But if we find a matched unrelated donor, not only that, the donor then has to agree to doing it, which isn't always the case. Um, if we can't find a matched unrelated donor, we then can do what's called a haploidentical transplant, which are half matches. Any biologic child, if it's really their child, which we've had some awkward discussions in clinic before regarding that, but if it's truly their child, uh, they have to be a half match. So we can usually find a donor for just about everyone, and then we can use umbilical cord, but I won't go into that. Uh, uh, um, so once you find a suitable donor, you then need to make sure the patient is appropriate for transplant. They have to have good psychosocial support. They have to have good fitness. Like if they have end-stage liver disease or heart disease or lung disease, you can throw transplant out the window. So we do all sorts of testing. They also have a good psychosocial support. And then they have to have disease that's like, for this particular disease, they have to have disease that's not blasting off. If this guy's like, leukemia cells are growing and growing, he'll blow right through the transplant. So you typically want your patient with a low burden of disease or really hardly any evidence of disease at all. Although you can still take them with active disease, it doesn't work as well. Because the principle of transplant 
you want the donor immune system to wake up and kill the cancer. It's going to take many months for that to happen. So if you have a very proliferative cancer, the transplants, we wouldn't do it. It just would go right through the transplant. Now, the, when we, we, once we find the donor, they're suitable, they're in a decent remission status, then we can say, okay, they're going to go to transplant. The next thing we decide on is the, the intensity of the conditioning. Unlike auto transplant, where everything's high intensity, for allogeneic transplant, we either do high or low intensity. And um, the high intensity is more morbid, uh, but we do it in young individuals. For older individuals, we do reduced intensity conditioning, where the chemo is really not even meant to get rid of the cancer. It's just meant to settle down the immune system so you can accept the new donor's immune system and then the donor's immune system can kill the cancer. So in this individual, I would probably accept that. And now that chemotherapy doesn't really help TP53 cancers anyways, it makes them grow. So uh, I would select a reduced intensity conditioning protocol. So they, they, we got the donor stem cells, we give them the chemo, we then infuse the stem cells. And now that this is a donor immune system, all these patients are at risk for graft versus host disease, which comes in two flavors either acute or chronic graft versus host disease. Acute graft versus host disease occurs with, within time from engraftment. And when I say engraftment, that's the time period when the donor immune system starts to grow back. That's usually 15 to 30 days after the stem cell infusion to day 100. And acute GVHD affects the gut, liver, or skin. So rash, liver failure, or diarrhea. It can be anywhere from mild to life-threatening. And then after about a few months, you can develop chronic graft versus host disease, which I won't go into. That's a whole different process. So we typically give immunosuppressant medications to prevent this, although we still see GVHD in half of our patients. Um, we actually want a little bit of GVHD. Those with GVHD have less of a chance of relapsing because they have an active immune system. In someone with this particular cancer, in this particular individual, I would taper her, him or her off immunosuppression rapidly. I want that immune system I'm fine with him getting some GVHD. I want that, he's gonna die a relapse. So I would get him off the immunosuppressants medications very fast and allow for his uh, immune system to really wake up. And um, uh, you know that's kind of a, an overview of, uh, of stem cell transplant. But in someone like this, the, even with all of that, it would probably only cure him five to 10% of the time at best. So you know, many of these patients, we don't even elect to go to transplant. It's not worth it. And to be honest, transplant could shorten his life. You know, he could be on the other therapy, have a year or so remission. We could do a transplant and have a catastrophic complication. And his, and, and even if it, you don't have that, they have, it's not like, you know, it's not like a pill and your life's fine. It's a whole nother set of things. We do have patients that do fine, but it's not like an easy thing to go through. So a lot of patients in these situations uh, uh, don't even elect transplant, which is not unreasonable. Um, so I don't know what this individual opted for. Do you know what happened? Yeah, so he got the bone marrow transplant. I'm actually rotating at uh, the bone marrow transplant uh, floor and uh, he's now day 15. Yeah, 15. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So that's good. You know, he's made it this far. I, I will say not, you don't need to, not to be a bummer, but almost all these patients will relapse within a year other than that small percent. I still would have done the same. I mean, he's fit and understands the risks and benefits. It's not unreasonable because it's not 0%. It's just, if you look at those curves. So, uh, um, 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 uh, but um, yeah, so I, uh, he got managed good. You guys did Cleveland clinic has a great stem cell transplant program. So you got, you guys will fix him. So awesome. That's so yeah. cool. <laughs> well, it was amazing. Thank you so much. Um, you can see like the teaching points there, just like going crazy. It's a lot of teaching points. Um, I have some questions. So Dr. Goodman, uh, when we saw the labs, uh, the pancytopenia, you mentioned about the need for the biopsy. Uh, mm -hmm. So for students and residents, when usually in classic situations do you consider to order a biopsy? Yeah, so that's a that's a hard question. I will say, pancytopenia almost always needs a bone marrow biopsy unless there's an obvious cause, like they just had a viral illness or they're cirrhotic. Um, and even in those individuals, you would follow their you know if you think it's a viral illness, you're not going to say see you in a year. You would follow the CBC to resolution to make sure you're not missing something horrible. Uh, um, so most of the times, uh, they, they, a pancytopenia needs a bone marrow biopsy. Um, for isolated anemia, most of the time they don't, other than that, what I just told you, the macrocytic anemia that you have no explanation, 
or even a normal cytokine anemia where you really have no explanation for it, then you should, you know, you need a reason for something, you, you know? So uh, now if I have a 98 year old with a macrocytic anemia that has no obvious explanation and a hemoglobin of 10 and they feel fine, yeah, they probably have a low grade mild dysplastic syndrome. I'm not going to bone marrow them. I'm going to, it won't change anything I do. I'm going to follow their counts and I'll explain to them. Some patients may want the bone marrow, but you don't need to do it. Uh, for isolated thrombocytopenia, you hardly ever have to do a bone marrow biopsy. It's usually largely explained uh, by a medication, acute illness, or, or ITP. So uh, those would be the indications for, for bone marrow biopsy. And then for staging of um, some of the lymphomas uh, that we treat, uh, uh, like to hide in the bone marrow. So we do uh, uh, staging bone marrow biopsies for them. Uh, but but my the rule of thumb is for a general medicine doctor, if you think maybe, if you don't have a reason for their hematologic abnormalities, it's, you send to a hematologist and then they'll make the decision whether they need to do, you will never need to make that decision. What you need to do as an internist is be like, they have blood problems and I can't, I don't know what the hell's going on. So then you need to send to a hematologist and then they will make the decision. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was great. Yep. Um, and like now looking at the case in general, do you have any reflections? What is important for st students and residents to take from this case? What, what was the question? Uh, for like looking at the case in general, the case discussion, uh, your final reflections, what is important for students and residents to consider in a case like this? Yeah, I mean, I think the main thing is like, you know, the second this CBC came back, you know, some to recognize that something, this isn't very good. Uh, this is a scary CBC. All lineages are out. It's macrocytic. It's screaming blood cancer. And, and, and that would be the, the biggest teaching point uh, to recognize that this guy, and this isn't one that needs a hematologist in six months. Some of these patients even warrant admission. You know, if this guy was febrile, game over, he needs to be admitted. Uh, um, because, you know, this is, this is when you, if you do refer, you don't go to sleep until you know they are set and scheduled with the hematologist, uh, because this actually still could be acute leukemia. Uh, um, and, and at least at, at our, um, depending on like, uh, uh, like if I'm seeing that usually I see them after, you know, uh, like someone like this, if they were very stable, I wouldn't admit, but like, I would be getting at least twice weekly or weekly CBCs and at least having telephone calls with the patient weekly until I have a diagnosis. Like I, I wouldn't be comfortable until then. So I think that would be the, the, the main teaching point uh, because you don't really need to know, you don't need to know all the MBSs. You, you know, you don't need to know how to, uh, the, the, how to do a bone marrow transplant uh, 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 and, you know, ruling out, you know, we ordered all that stuff, but I would like you to recognize from this guy's history, the tempo, and then the cytopenias and MCV that all that other stuff we did was almost probably not necessary and it's going to be an MDS. Like to me, it was blatantly obvious that this was going to be a myelodysplastic syndrome uh, given the, the presentation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, that was amazing. Uh, Dr. Alessio, I would like to, to know your final reflections, your reflections about taking care of this case and this case discussion. Yeah. Well, it was great. It was great. Uh... I think that um, we now uh, third year, I, I've, I've seen a lot of cases where you see um, anemia, um, thrombocytopenia, and uh, sometimes pancytopenia. And sometimes those pancytopenias come in, in, our, in, in our primary care clinic. Uh, it's, it's interesting to have, because MDS is actually quite common, right, uh, Dr. Goodman? In older individuals, and I left out one thing, the setting you're in. Pancytopenia in your clinic is different than someone who was admitted to the hospital with who knows what the hell was wrong with them and then becomes pancytopenic. That setting, the pancytopenia isn't as important. Like all of our ICU patients are, you know, if they came to the hospital without, with basically normal counts and then become pancytopenic, what are the odds they developed MDS or acute leukemia during their week stay in the hospital? Basically zero. Now I get those consults all the time. I used to when I did regular hematology, but uh, the clinical context matters completely. Here's someone who was fine. And then over six months comes to your clinic with pancytopenia. That needs a marrow. The patient in the hospital with septic shock from whatever doesn't need the bone marrow with pancytopenia. Does that make sense? I think that's another important teach point. It's what the clinical context is. 
And another point I would like uh, to mention is like, what is the uh, the points that as clinicians we need like to transfuse the patients? Uh, should we look for that? And uh, I know that like like blood disorders are blood dyscrasias. They come you know, like in inpatient, outpatient. But when would you like transfuse and and do something other than the bone marrow biopsy? Yeah, I mean, well, you know, every institution has their own guidelines, but but I would say that any patient with blood cancer or suspected blood cancer, they should get leukoreduced or radiated uh, blood products, which is pretty much standard at most places, at least where I practice. And we leukoreduce to get rid of the risk of CMV. We irradiate to get rid of the risk of transfusion associated grafters host disease that comes up on boards. Um, as far as thresholds, um, you know, every time we study uh, transfusion thresholds, lower is better. For almost all circumstances, exclude, forget about sickle cell. And I, I don't want to talk about that. I don't keep up with sickle cell. But for most things, uh, lower is better. So for my patients, if they are, you know, we don't even consider unless they're under seven, unless they're really symptomatic. And if they're, I have my patients that are chronically low, if they're, if they're six, but like it's stable and they're not overtly symptomatic, I actually don't transfuse. So, um, but, but usually under seven is if you wanted a, a threshold. For platelets, they've studied this in depth. Um, the risk of spontaneous bleeding is really uh, not there till under 10. So uh, uh, I would recommend prophylactic platelet transfusions for those under 10. Outside of that, um, you know, depending on what their access to blood work is and where they live, you know, you might want to do 20, but uh, 10 is our threshold in the hospital for blood cancers. So like this guy, I mean, he doesn't necessarily need a transfusion uh, uh, unless he was really, really symptomatic. And uh, one, one other question is, how uh, concerned would you be about um, uh, clots in him um, of having like a DIC? Is this a procoagulant state or not? Uh, I'm not worried at all about DIC in this individual, uh, right? The, I didn't give an LDH, but his Billy's, you know, he's not hemolyzing. Uh, um, and, um, you know, DIC with an MDS, or an, uh, that would be very unusual as opposed to frank acute myeloid leukemia. Um, uh, we, stip we typically, unless they're bleeding, uh, we, I would do prophylactic anticoagulation uh, until their platelets are under 50. They're still at risk for clots. Um, sometimes I even do 40,000. So it depends on the scenario. I mean, if his coags are fine, his fibrinogen's fine, this is someone, if he was acutely hospitalized, would still get prophylactic anticoagulation. Cool. Oh, infectious prophy. That's a very long, complicated discussion. For an MDS, not on therapy, I would not give him uh, antibiotic prophylaxis. That's very complicated. They, they get prophylaxis. But for like acute myeloid leukemia, for someone getting induction therapy, we have good data. There's very high risks of fungal infections. It's not just the neutropenia, right? It's what you're giving them. When you give them chemo, you screw up the gut barrier. Uh, there's inflammation. So those are all risks for infections. So acute myeloid leukemia getting induction therapy uh, intensive chemo, get fungal prophylaxis and antibacterial uh, prophylaxis. Uh, we usually give everyone acyclovir. I don't know the data on that. Uh, as far as PJP prophylaxis for myeloid malignancies, generally they don't need PJP prophylaxis, right? The medicines we're giving are not very lymphosuppressive, right? We're treating the myeloid lineage. Unlike ALL and some lymphomas where we're giving, you know, purine analogs or cladribine, things that are going to uh, uh, cause lymphopenia for in low uh, CD4 counts, those patients would get a uh, PJP prophylaxis. Uh, so for this guy, nothing. Once he gets a transplant, he'll get a bunch of uh, a prophy, but that, that I won't talk about. Other questions from the history? Could the neck pain be, I can't read the rest of it. Uh, it's asking if it, it could be nerve impeachment or it could be explained by another reason. Probably another reason this individual for MDS, it would be weird to have nerve impingement. Now with acute leukemia, you can occasionally see chloromas or masses of leukemia cells. That's specific for specific types. Um, uh, uh, it would be still, even with acute myeloid leukemia, it'd be very unusual to present with chloromas, although it happens in a few percent. For MDS, it would be, right, if he had a chloroma, if this guy also had a chloroma, a mass of leukemia cells, he actually wouldn't have the diagnosis of MDS anymore. It would actually be acute myeloid leukemia. So that would be, I wouldn't expect that. And this particular individual, 
Uh, I wouldn't expect it to be related. Also, the risk of central nervous system dissemination for myeloid leukemias is very low, unlike acute lymphoblastic leukemia, where it's present in 5 to 10% of patients at diagnosis. And if you don't treat the CNS, there's lots of relapses there. It's very unusual in myeloid leukemias, although possible, uh, much more unusual. Thank you very much. It was an amazing discussion, amazing case. Uh, yeah, we learned it a lot. Great. Uh, so now I'm going to pass the mic to Sammy for some teaching points. Thank you so much for this amazing case, Dr. Alexa and Dr. Goodman. That was just insane. <laughs> that was very educational. And thank you so much for joining us today. I will just go over some quick teaching points. So we had the dyspnea. We should always think about disorders of heart and lung first, which covers the vast majority, but also blood, for example, anemia, acidosis, thyrotoxicosis, and also anxiety or neuromuscular disorders can cause it. Dysfunctional blood cells and their consequences when leukocytes are down, predisposed infections, when we have anemia, patients experience fatigue or dyspnea, and when they are low platelets, it comes to easy bruising or petechiae. And Dr. Goodman told us the nice pearl that the more cell lines are down, the more likely the bone marrow is the cause. And it's very important to classify it as acute, subacute, chronic. Fatigue represents a highly unspecific symptom. And you always have to look for other clues and think, also, and think for example, of endocrinopathies, for example, hypothyroidism, anemia, obstructive sleep apnea, systemic illness, medications, but also depression is very important to think about. And Dr. Goodman told us that it's important to get a baseline. Was the patient diet before? And he would get the CBC and the BMP in this patient. And then we had this isolate. We didn't have the isolated macrocytic anemia, but Dr. Goodman told us about it. So we should always check B12, B9. Um, union lineage, MDS can present like that most importantly, but also medications, alcohol abuse, but also hemolytic anemia due to reticulocytosis. So we, he would always get a smear and hemolytic parameters. And if it's positive, get a Coombs test. For the differential of chronic pancytopenia, it can be due to lack of material, for example, B12, B9, copper deficiency, myelophthesis, for example, leukemia, lymphoma, solid cancer mats, granulomatous infections, more commonly over aplastic anemia, and lastly, peripheral destruction, for example, seen in CLL, SLE, or tick-borne diseases. Copper deficiency is a rare cause of a rare mimic of MBS, so we should can always keep it in the back of our minds. It can cause a hyponormal or hypochromic anemia, also leukopenia and thrombocytopenia. It can also have neuro neurologic manifestations. Then we had this interesting finding of pseudopelga Hue cells and peripheral smear, which just represent hypersegmented neutrophils, which are mostly seen in MDS. And they are called because there is a norm variant that's called, that's called pelga Hue and it's congenital and has these cells and it's caused by a mutation in the lamin B receptor. Yes, but when it's congenital, we don't call it pseudo. It's just called yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, that I, uh, I mistyped that. I didn't, so I didn't say it. <laughs> so um, it's important to never say you have good cancer to patients with indolent cancers. Cancers always try to be empath empathic. And MDS presents with a wide variety of symptoms, severity and survival, indolent versus rapidly progressive. And Dr. Goodman told us, that the TP53 MDS is nearly an AML equivalent with decreased long-term survival. Then he taught us also about the difference between autologous and allogenic stem cell transplant. The autologous stem cell transplant, the stem cells get collected, the patient receives chemo chemotherapy and gets his own stem cells back versus allogenic, where he receives high-dose chemo, bone marrow stem cells from a donor, and then also the graft versus leukemia effect um, depletes the malignant cells, which can have, have as a complication a graft versus host disease, which acutely manifests with gut, liver, and skin manifestations with diarrhea, elevated LFTs, or macular eruption up to 100 days. And if it's chronic, it's over 100 days, has, addition, has other symptoms, for example, skin fibrosis. Um, setting of, it's very important to consider the setting with pancytopenia when it's the primary manifestation versus it's acquired during hospital, for example, in sepsis, it really shifts our differential. For example, in this patient, this was the primary manifestation, so it shifted us more towards the bone marrow. And last but not least, and also very important, how do, we, how do I become a bone marrow donor? Um, consider signing up. It's important to, to 
rare matches of HLA alleles, and the website is vvbdematch.org. And yeah, that's it. Thank you so much, everyone, for participating today. And thank you again, Dr. Goodman and Dr. Thank Alexa, for setting this great case up and discussion. And I think we all learned so much. Good. Well, I'll see you guys online or at conferences in person. It was nice meeting everyone. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And just to remind, let's sign up to be a don uh, bone marrow donor. Yeah. Bye. Yeah, but if you get chosen, you got to do it. It's not bad. <laughs> All right, bye, guys. Bye. Thank you.